laboratory directions for the female reproductive system. Number one, be able to recognize and describe the histological structure of the ovary. Two, begin a, be able to recognize and describe the morphological differences that occur between ovarian follicles at different stages of maturation. Three, be able to recognize and describe follicles that have undergone atresia. Four, be able to recognize and describe a corpus luteum. Five, be able to recognize and describe the oviduct. Six, be able to recognize and describe the structure, structural organization of the uterine wall. And number seven, be able to recognize and describe the structural organization of the endometrium and the histological changes that occur during the three primary phases of the uterine cycle, proliferative, secretory, menstrual. This particular section is uh, an ovarian mid-sagittal section through the a primate ovary, illustrating uh, as visualized with the eye, the hilar area here attached to this little hilar stalk. One can envision the medulla extending up and occupying the center of this particular structure, that is the ovary, and then the surrounding cortex, which will contain the ver follicles at various stages of differentiation. Larger one is indicated here, smaller ones uh, here. So this entire structure, uh, beginning where the tip of the arrow is to the external surface, this is all ovarian cortex. Of course, lying on the cortex, uh, limiting the external surface of the ovary, will be the so-called germinal epithelium or that peritoneal covering. So this is a visual demonstration of a section through the ovary. This particular section is through a primate ovary taken with the scanning objective. What's shown in the top of the field of view and indicated by the pointer is the area of the hyalus showing a, a considerable number of blood vessels that are going to go in and to supply the ovary itself. <coughs> now extending beyond the uh, hyalur area, one can see it extends up into the center of this particular organ and forms the medulla of the ovary. And this medullary area is being traced by the pointer until we get to the surface and then it uh, disappears within the uh, cortex. So if we move to an area such as this, midway, the region extending for the where the arrow now indicates to approximately this area is all cortex. It will contain the growing follicles, follicles or remnants of follicles in that particular area. We are now crossing the medulla and now the arrow is on the border of the cortex on the opposite side which will then once again extend out to the uh, germinal epithelium or the peritoneal covering of the ovary. So all of the reason, region that is now being traced with the low power objective is that outer layer that is the cortex which will house the follicles of various sizes as, and their development as well as the corpus uh, luteum, corpus albicans and other structures associated with the cycle of the uh, follicles. And once again we're down at the base of the ovary uh, into that hyalur area where it, it, the connective tissue and vessels penetrate and enter into the uh, medullary region. It's this region of the hyalus that in some uh, pregnant individuals, uh, menopausal individuals, that those hyalus cells develop 
The hyalur cells, as one will recall, are equivalent to the interstitial cells or the Leydig cells of the testis. And they will have masculizing effects as they produce uh, androgens. The region of cortex at its periphery illustrates the so-called germinal epithelium or that peritoneal covering uh, is indicated by the arrow, this layer of simple cuboidal type cells. This dense region of collagen and fibroblasts that extends to about this level as indicated by the arrow. So this entire region here as seen under uh, the high power objective is the tunica albiginia. It forms that white rind or covering around the uh, cortex of the ovary. Now if one goes just interior to the tunic albuginea and actually enters the stroma of the cortex, primordial follicles can be observed. This particular structure here is a primordial follicle, as is this particular structure. One can see the nucleus and the cytoplasm of a developing oocyte. The follicular cells usually are flattened and uh, form a single layer of cells uh, limiting the uh, primordial follicle. Another primordial follicle is shown here at the arrow with its contained uh, oocyte and surrounding flattened single layer of follicular cells. This is another example of the primordial follicle. Now with time and with uh, stimulation, uh, the follicles, as one will recall, begin to grow. Uh, the cells initially uh, have a single layer of very flattened cells, then they begin to cube up as uh, seen be indicated here, and then will continue to grow and develop and become primary follicles. An example of an early primary follicle is shown here. The oocyte continues to develop. The zona pellucida shows its uh, initial beginnings and is being laid down as indicated by the arrow. And the follicular cells proliferate and form a stratified layer. So these are all follicular cells and they, these multi-layers of follicular cells constitute the stratum uh, granulosum. One can also see the initial organization of these thin fibroblast-like cells surrounding uh, this particular follicle forming a uh, capsular-like structure or an envelopment around the growing follicle. This is the forming theca. This is an additional region of the cortex illustrating primordial follicles and their subcomponents and a comparison in size and development to a early primary follicle and its various subcomponents. An additional field of ovarian cortex at a lesser magnification but illustrates quite well several primordial follicles with their contained oocytes. An early, very early, it could go either way, uh, primary, one could still call this however a primordial if one so desired. Notice that the cells of the follicular cells are beginning to cube up. Another very early primary, definitely a primary with the stratified uh, layer of granulosa cells and then a well-established primary follicle uh, as indicated by the arrow where the granulosa cells are forming perhaps a third layer of stratification. Notice that as this process takes place, as the follicle grows 
it increases in overall size, the follicular layer cubes up, begins to stratify, the theca then begins to organize around it, forming this encapsulated structure, and uh, these elements become more and more exaggerated as the follicle increases in size. Note, too, that the oocyte, the developing oocyte, also is increasing in size. The field has just been moved slightly, uh, tracing the development of our primary follicle, beginning here, a little bit larger, and then uh, considerably larger in uh, this particular area. So it gives one the idea of this progression in the growth of these particular uh, follicles. Coming into the field is a relatively large secondary follicle. One can make out the uh, follicular cells. They appear much, much lighter. Several vacuoles with liquor folliculi within them, as shown here. And even though the ovum is not present, uh, one can safely assume with these features that this is a uh, fairly large secondary follicle. This is the same region of ovarian cortex, but now examined uh, with the low power objective, showing the progression of events and size relationships of primordial, extraordinarily early primary, 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 as it increases in size, and finally to a portion of a secondary follicle that we were observing previously, showing you this vast sea of granulosa cells and the tremendous stratification that has taken place. The granulosa cells now appear lighter. There are these lakes of liquor folliculi, uh, making their appearance. These will then fuse together and form the antrum of the mature follicle. The oocyte is not visible on this section and is out of the field of view. One can see the theca has expanded. It's becoming more and more vascularized. And one should also be able to see a difference in the, uh, be able to differentiate the theca interna from the theca externa at this particular point. A region of the follicular wall of the secondary that was examined previously, but now at high magnification, showing the granulosa cells at the bottom of the field of view. And one can discern uh, about the width of the arrow, the theca interna, no, one, some vascular elements can be made, so these, this is a well vascularized uh, type of tissue. Note two, if we go over here just a little bit to emphasize that point, note two that the cells of the theca interna are beginning to round up a little bit. Uh, you'll see uh, lipid droplets accumulating. Remember, this is going to be a steroidogenic type of a zone where androgens are being produced which will then diffuse across to the follicular cells and uh, the aromatase complex of enzymes will then modify these androgens to produce estradiol, primarily estrogens, which will then will diffuse back and enter the uh, vascular system and enter the systemic circulation. So what we can see on this particular follicle is a thin developing theca interna the theca externa forms more of a capsular-like structure, a dense interwoven mat of uh, connective tissue fibers and stromal cells that are very fibroblast-like in nature and encapsulate uh, this entire structure. The only way one can discern them from the surrounding stroma is their orientation and encapsulation around the follicle itself. And perhaps they are just a little bit uh, more densely organized. Here in this particular profile, uh, one can see them organized uh, quite well around the circumference of this secondary follicle. And this, beginning about this level, 
this region in here is going to be the uh, theca interna, that stereogenic uh, type of zone. Another little area of the follicular wall, you can see that it evidence that it's still growing as one can visualize uh, mitotic figures uh, in this uh, preparation as well. So it's still actively uh, dividing. Uh, so there's not one here, one here, and there are several uh, around uh, in the follicular wall. Theca interna, theca externa here in this particular segment. This particular follicle is a relatively late primary follicle. Uh, one can see the continuing development of the oocytus with regard to size. The well-established zona pellucida is now being indicated and traced by the pointer and the continued proliferation and development of the granulosa uh, layer of follicular cells. So this now consists of five or six layers of cells actively dividing, even with this low power uh, objective, mitotic figures uh, can still be observed as indicated by the uh, pointer. The theca continues to show uh, more development. There is beginning vascularization around it and perhaps even steroidogenic activity uh, in the Therica interna cells. For co comparison in size, uh, the adjacent field shows some primordial follicles. So this is a well-established growing primary follicle. An additional region of uh, ovarian cortex, but seen once again with the low power objective, comparing primordial and primary uh, follicles uh, as they increase in size. Uh, this was the one photographed uh, or viewed earlier, uh, showing a well developed primary follicle with both a surrounding theca and continued development of the granulosa cells as well as the oocyte. This, these structures shown here and indicated by the arrow are connective tissue scars. They're examples of the corpus albicans. As one courses uh, around the cortex of this particular o ovary, one runs into this particular structure and one can see just a nip through the zona pellucida. So this oocyte is just out of the field of section. This would be an early secondary, getting a nick through a developing follicular antrum here with the contained uh, liquor folliculi. And with close observation, one can also discern the theca, quite well developed. Uh, the tip of the arrow traces its external surface, and it, of course, is going to be subdivided into a theca interna and externa. So this is a growing uh, secondary follicle, as indicated uh, by the pointer. Another secondary type follicle, uh, continuing to increase in size. The oocyte is not showing, but one can make out the follicular antrum quite well, as well as the theca uh, developing uh, this encapsulation around the granulosa cells. And finally, we get to a relatively mature secondary follicle, a mature follicle, or very close to a graphene follicle. Uh, one can make out the continued increase in volume and uh, the space occupied by the follicular antrum. The zona pellucida is very, very obvious at this point and stains quite well. The cumulus cells that hold the oocyte are still intact. And this initial layer of cells that surrounds the zona pellucida is also known as the corona radiata. The theca cells are quite well developed, or the theca is, and uh, one can see this surrounding encapsulation uh, around this particular follicle. So this is a mature secondary follicle uh, approaching a graphene follicle which would be uh, just prior to ovulation. A 
a region of a secondary follicle or almost a graphene follicle, a mature follicle, seen it with an increase in magnification, showing you the surrounding theca, subdivided into a theca externa and a theca interna, which is right at the very tip of the pointa. The externa is out in this area here. I was a little bit quick with the pointer in the previous demonstration. So that is the theca. These are all granulosa cells, as seen at increased magnification. Notice that this follicle is still growing as mitotic activity is still apparent. This is the oocyte. It has reached its maximum size earlier. The surrounding zona pellucida, and then a single layer of cells, the corona radiata, with the follicular antrum being here. And if we move this just slightly, in classic terms, uh, this region, the stock region, is the cumulus oophorus uh, type of uh, structure. But those are all granulosa cells. Only those forming that single layer around the zona pellucida are classically referred to as the corona radiata, and they will go with the oocyte and zona pellucida at ovulation. So this is a mature follicle seeing that increased magnification. This is a portion of a mature graphene follicle of an additional preparation uh, showing perhaps a little bit better the cells of the theca interna, which are showing here, these large vacuolated steroidogenic uh, type cells. Uh, and of course, in addition to that, their uh, vascularity. So this would be a region of well-developed uh, theca interna and the steroidogenic uh, type of activity. This is what was being referred to earlier as these cells plump up, begin to accumulate lipid droplets, and are actively involved in steroidogenesis. The granulosa cells continue to show an abundance of mitotic figures. However, I also notice some carrier excess or some pycnotic activity, so that it may be indeed the case that this uh, very large follicle does not make it uh, to ovulation. But nonetheless, it's good at illustrating that point of the theca interna, its vascularization, and these very plump uh, looking uh, lipid filled uh, cells in the theca interna. And here one can make out uh, capillaries and perhaps a little bit better the uh, uh, nature of the vasculature that is characteristic of the theca interna. Again, another region of the ovarian uh, cortex. And please recall that the development of the cohort of, let's say, 25 to 30 follicles, uh, and as they develop to produce estrogen in that one group and are controlled by FSH, only one or two of these at the most usually reach uh, maturity and actually ovulated. The rest of them degenerate in this process known as atresia. And this is a almost a mature follicle or a graphene follicle that came this far and then underwent atresia. The theca can be made out as this encapsulation, but as one examines the interior, the granulosa cells are completely gone, degenerate. The oocyte, of course, is gone, though it could have been out of the field. But with this type of a view, this is no question that this is uh, a very atretic follicle and that's undergoing involution, uh, or pretty much has already gone, uh, this uh, involution of or atresia. Now, if one goes around this particular ovary, here is another large follicle, almost that equivalent size to the former one that was observed. Notice once again the nature of the granulosa cells making up the follicular wall, all degenerate, pycnotic, shedding, 
and just totally degenerate. So this uh, follicle as well, and one can make out the, the remnant of the ovum and zona pellucida, these are all completely gone and are, are well in their way uh, of involuting and are atretic. See, this is a, a slightly smaller one. Again, this whole series has, is undergoing atresia. They reached a secondary follicle. Some of them looked like they were very mature follicles, but nonetheless, all of these follicles examined in this particular segment, these last three, uh, there's no question about it that they're extraordinarily uh, atretic. And if one examines this uh, small follicle here as well, in the center of the field of view and entered, uh, uh, indicated by the pointer. This is another one that's undergone extreme uh, tresia. Let's examine this portion of a secondary follicle that's also uh, atretic, but not nearly as uh, far along as the other, other uh, follicles, and uh, examine some of the granulosa cells in a little bit greater detail. These are the granulosa cells of the former follicle that showed signs of uh, atresia, uh, an early secondary follicle. Note the vacuolization amongst the granulosa cells. Note the fragmentation of uh, nuclei in some cases. This apparently appears to be a macrophage that's taking up in phagocytizing material, as is here. Uh, the nuclei will start becoming more pycnotic and undergo fragmentation of this karyorexis. And as one looks through uh, the granulosa cells of this secondary follicle, this phenomenon repeats itself over and over again. Uh, structures uh, like this, these round fragmenting structures, an invasion of macrophages, vacuolization of the follicular cells themselves, all indicative that this follicle is in the process of involuting and is going to become uh, atretic. Another uh, atretic secondary follicle as seen at high magnification with the remnants of the zona pellucida and the fragmented oocyte uh, in the center of the field of view the zona being uh, here. And notice the granulosa cells have gone beyond the stage of the former follicle that was examined. And uh, there you, one can make out a connective tissue or a stromal type of invasion uh, going on, and it's going to replace uh, these degenerative uh, follicular cells uh, as well as uh, everything contained within it. So this sort of a, is an advanced atresia of another secondary follicle. Just a very short clip of human ovarian cortex demonstrating primordial follicles as well as a very early primary follicle with their contained uh, oocytes uh, from a human preparation. And this is an, another example from the specimen of human ovary showing a uh, mature secondary follicle approaching a graphene follicle. The oocyte and zona pellucida can be made as indicated by the arrow. The granulosa cells and the cumulus are here, uh, the rest of the granulosa cells, and then the theca surrounding thecal material uh, beyond that point. Uh, these are mainly degenerative changes that are being observed uh, in this particular follicle rather than atresia. Uh, and finally, the appearance of a corpus albicans uh, from a human, human ovary uh, stained with hematoxin and eosin uh, type stain. So this is the white scar that is seen, that corpus albicans which will then eventually be reabsorbed back into the ovarian stroma.
This is the section of uh, human ovary that contains a portion of a corpus luteum. The ovarian cortex, of course, is shown here, and this large structure, as indicated by the pointer, about the size of a thumbnail, or even between a dime and a nickel, if you're counting change, uh, is about the size that these large endocrine structures can uh, t uh, obtain. So it's, the section has been cut here, so this is just a portion of the ovary with the contained uh, corpus luteum within it. This area here, as indicated and outlined by the pointer, is the remnants of a fibrin clot within the center <coughs> of this particular structure. Even at this relatively low magnification, one can easily make out the elements of the wall of the corpus luteum. These cells here, forming this light gray cast and forming the majority of the corpus luteum, are the granulosa lutein cells. The theca lutein cells are coming from the theca and are in a band just external to the granulosa lutein cells and will also be found in cords of connective tissue that extend up into this uh, collapsed follicle. Please remember what the corpus luteum is. It is the remnants of the follicle of a previously uh, mature follicle in which the ovum has been liberated or ovulated. The only elements that are lost within that uh, graphene follicle is the follicular fluid, the ovum, the surrounding zona pellucida, and a single layer of cells, usually the corona radiata. The remainder of the follicle remains within the ovary and undergoes the process of luteinization under the influence of LH. The former granulosa cells of the follicle now become the granulosa lutein cells. The cells of the theca also undergo luteinization, and these will become the theca lutein cells. So we will now examine a small area to look for these two cell types, the theca lutein cells and the granulosa lutein cells. This is a portion of the corpus luteum as seen at under the microscope, the scanning objective of the microscope. This region here, as indicated by the pointer, is the fibrin clot. We'll now progress into the wall of the uh, corpus luteum. So the majority of these cells here are granulosa lutein cells. One can see the surrounding theca uh, in this area. It extends cords of tissue that extend up into and between the granulosa cells uh, in this collapsed follicle. So this region here, in addition to uh, blood vessels and, some, uh, and connective tissue type elements, will also contain the theca lutein cells. Now if one courses around the external uh, or the circumference of the corpus luteum, one can see that this repeats itself over and over again. Here's a, a perhaps a little bit better example with this scanning objective showing you one of these uh, cords of theca lutein cells and the connective tissue elements extending up a considerable distance uh, into the wall of the corpus luteum between the granulosa lutein cell. Here is another example shown here. This is the external region of the uh, corpus luteum again, seen at a slight increase in magnification. To illustrate the intense vascularization of this particular structure, after all, it is an endocrine organ, and uh, this should not be a surprise. Uh, even at this low magnification, one can see one of these uh, cords of connective tissue of the theca that have extended up into the granulosa cells as this follicle collapses upon itself. 
So these smaller cells, as indicated and outlined by the arrow, are all theca lutein cells as compared to the granulosa lutein cells that are now being crossed uh, by the pointer. If we move down just uh, a little bit, here is again another one of the folds uh, containing a blood vessel and then theca cells that will extend a considerable distance uh, as this follicle has collapsed upon itself up into the structure of the uh, corpus uh, luteum. And one can see a, a little blood vessel, so this strand of connective tissue from the theca extends up this far, and these vessels actually grow and extend up into the theca as well, dragging with them uh, some of these uh, theca lutein cells. So once again, way up in the substance of the corpus luteum, you will find theca lutein cells along these cords or strands of connective tissue with the vasculature and of course are surrounded by the granulosa lutein cells. So this is all corpus luteum as seen at an intermediate uh, power. Same region ex except seen at increased magnification illustrating the vessel. These are granulosa lutein cells, these very large uh, plump ones. And if we extend up into the structure of the corpus luteum, just to illustrate and compare uh, the size of the thecal lutein cells along this cord of connective tissue and vessel as it's coursing uh, towards that fire burn clot, you can see it extends up uh, this far in this particular field. That would be the capillary. The surrounding cells in this area, which also are becoming vascularized, obviously, are the granulosa lutein cells. This is all uh, corpus luteum and the two important cell types that are associated uh, with it. The theca lutein cells, which are shown in this cluster, quite a bit smaller than the surrounding uh, granulosa lutein cells. This particular section is a section through the proximal oviduct, proximal ampullary region, I should say, very close to the infundibulum, that funnel-shaped uh, distal end of the oviduct. The oviduct consists of a mucosa, as does the rest of the uh, female reproductive tube system, and that mucosa, in this particular case, is lined by a ciliated, simple columnar lining epithelium. There's a few pleaky or folds, villus-like folds, uh, sticking up and being traced uh, by the arrow. The next layer, in addition to the mucosa, is the muscularis, which consists of an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle, and then finally, it is the entire structure is covered by a serosa, uh, a peritoneal covering, simple squamous mesothelial lining with a little bit of connective tissue. The reason it is suspected that this section is taken very proximally in the ampullary portion of the oviduct is the appearance of structures such as this. This is a core of smooth muscle and you can see the little pleaky or villus-like folds coming off from it, much like a hand. This, I believe, to be a, uh, one of the fimbriae, uh, one of those frond-like structures that extends along the perimeter of the infundibular portion. Uh, it's fairly motile, has a ciliary beat to help drag or move the ovum once it's liberated into the lumen of the oviduct. The central lumen, I believe, to be here, though it's hidden by all the little uh, pleakier folds of the mucous membrane. A region of the lining epithelium of the oviduct showing the simple columnar epithelium that is ciliated. So it is a ciliated uh, simple columnar type of epithelium. If one looks very carefully at the tip of the pointer, one can make out individual cilia on the surface of these particular cells 
as was well a little bit further down and it once again indicated by the arrow. Indeed, most of this surface appears to be ciliated. One can assume so if one looks very carefully once again at the tip of the pointer. One can make out this little beaded line uh, which is indicative of the basal bodies which will form the axioneme that lies within the individual uh, cilia of the ciliated cells. Now some of the cells such as here that, that are not ciliated and kind of stick out and oftentimes balloon out into the lumen are the so-called PEG cells. Remember, the entire surface is not, not all the cells are ciliated. There seems to be an alternating pattern between ciliated simple columnar and a secretory type of cell, uh, routinely call that PEG cell. Uh, so there is a secretory type of cell in this particular region as well, alternating with the ciliated uh, cell. Nonetheless, the lining epithelium is classified as a ciliated simple columnar epithelium. An additional illustration of the ciliated simple columnar epithelium lining the oviduct, showing both ciliated cells and then the gaps between where the basal bodies cease, the apices of these so-called secretory cells within the oviduct, the PEG cells. PEG cells so named because of their dark staining nuclei that oftentimes ride a little bit higher within the epithelial lining, and it gave the early investigators uh, the impression that these were uh, small pegs within the epithelium. Another shown here, its apex is ballooning out into the lumen of the oviduct. Another example is shown here and here as well on this particular surface. Nonetheless, this is a ciliated simple columnar type of epithelium consisting of both ciliated cells and the secretory type, the so-called PEG cell. Okay. This is an intermediate power through one of the pleaky or folds uh, within the oviduct and of course covered by the ciliated simple columnar lining epithelium. What this illustrates is a small core of lamina propria extending up into the core of one of these pleaky. And now as we, if we go uh, laterally through the wall of the structure, the other layers of the oviductal wall can be visualized. First of all, an inner circular layer of smooth muscle is indicated here. The lamina propria uh, is over in this area just beneath the epithelium, fairly thin in this area. So now we're entering the muscularis. As I mentioned earlier, this is the inner circular layer. Obviously with the change in the direction of uh, muscle fibers or cross-sectional profile, this is the outer longitudinal layer. And then, oh, this large vessel here we're coursing by on the external surface, a small artery. And then finally we get to the uh, serosa, which is lying on the exterior uh, surface of the oviduct and is shown at this particular uh, point. This is a section of uh, human uterus taken, I believe, during the third or fourth day of the menstrual cycle. So it's very, very early proliferative if you want to look at it that, uh, from that particular perspective. But if one observes, one can still make out pools of blood within the stroma, a lack of epithelial cells at this particular location location along the uterine lumen. And if one goes along, you can see some of the surface has been re-epithelialized with the glands coming out and migrating and proliferating over uh, the top. So what we're looking at now is endometrium. Also note that how thin the endometrium is. This is a low power view but we're getting the depth of the endometrium fills the entire field. 
Uh, so it's only a few millimeters in depth. Another clue that this is uh, uh, probably very early in the proliferative phase or the late menstrual period, which it is. More blood uh, lying within the endometrial stroma. One can see the glands very straight. We can pick out even at this magnification a few mitotic figures. And so this is what this membrane or mucous membrane or endometrium looks like at the very earliest of the proliferative uh, phases, but it's being classified as uh, a, a menstrual uh, section, but evidently very late in that uh, period or very close to the early proliferative phase. And coursing into the field of view at the moment is a very, very thick robust myometrium with its interwoven masses of uh, smooth muscle as one would expect. The same endometrial biopsy of the menstrual section uh, just reconfirming at a slight increased magnification what has already been discussed the sort of denuded surface uh, of the epithelium, though epithelium is proliferating rapidly out of these glands and recovering this denuded surface. Still quite a few pools of uh, blood within the surface, as one can see, uh, filled with both red cells and white cells. Here we see the uh, uterine lining epithelium, a simple ciliated columnar form, has been reestablished coming out from the uterine glands, which are, of course, fairly straight at this particular stage. And so uh, this is very, very close, as I mentioned earlier, to the uh, proliferative phase. Uh, But this is an example of one of those, uh, how one of these biopsies would appear late in the uh, menstrual period. It's already been uh, re-epithelializing itself. The glands seem to have re-established re continuity with the surface lining epithelium that is provided it. And uh, very shortly, within a couple of days, this would be uh, uh, well along into the proliferative phase of the endometrium. This is example uh, again an example of a section illustrating uh, endometrium somewhere between the early and mid uh, proliferative uh, phase. This particular image has been taken with the scanner unlike the previous section that we were looking at it with an intermediate objective. The surface lining epithelium of the uterus, that simple columnar ciliated epithelium is showing here at the tip of the arrow. So this is the lumen of the uterus. Look at the overall depth now of the endometrium. You can see even though the structure looks fairly similar, the depth is considerably different. And finally we run here to the junction. This area now indicated by the arrow is all uh, myometrium. The glands are quite obvious. A little bit of a torture arsity here in this basal layer. But as one gets uh, nearer to the surface, look at the nature of the glands. Extraordinarily straight, undergoing rapid proliferation, hence the proliferative zone. And even though there's a little bit of blood uh, still residing within the stroma that will be uh, eventually reabsorbed. The surface is completely re-epithelialized. The glands are very long and straight, and numerous mitotic figures should be observed both within the glands, the uterine glands, which these are examples of, and in the surrounding stroma. Both of these elements are undergoing a rapid proliferation uh, under the influence of uh, estrogen primarily also proliferating, and we will uh, be a, 
on watch for it are the spiral arteries. Let's examine this now at increased magnification. This is the endometrium of that early to mid proliferative phase showing three adjacent uterine glands with the intermediate objective. Note the straight nature of the glands. They're made up of a simple columnar type of epithelium and are separated by intervening stromal cells. Note too, in addition to the very straight nature of these glands, the numerous mitotic figures. One is shown here at the tip of the arrow, one here, one there, one there, here. So as one begins to uh, look around and examine these glands in a little bit more detail, numerous mitotic figures will be observed within the uh, uterine glandular epithelium. They're proliferating at an incredible rate. Also, note the mitotic figures as indicated here, 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 and here. And these are mitoses that are now being seen in the stroma. And of course, continued mitotic activity being observed within the uh, uterine glands. So there's a tremendous amount of mitotic activity within this entire lining, that is the endometrium. So this is what is characterizing the endometrium in the proliferative phase. Very straight, elongated glands exhibiting numerous mitotic figures, indicating that rapid growth rate, as well as abundant mitoses within the surrounding stroma are undergoing this tremendous proliferative uh, rate uh, in this in this particular say, phase, the proliferative phase of the uh, menstrual cycle. And then finally, back to the surface, a simple columnar lining type of epithelium, and it will show uh, cilia. Some of the cilia extend down into the glands, uh, but they're not as abundant as those on the superficial epithelium. An example of a portion of a uterine gland seen at high magnification. The basement membrane of this gland or the epithelium of this gland is located on this side. Its opposing wall is shown here and what it shows is the tall columnar nature of this lining epithelium as well as two mitotic figures associated with this small glandular profile. A region of endometrial stroma showing numerous mitotic figures as well and indeed this may be just a portion of a growing vessel coming out so, because considerable angiogenesis is also occurring. But nonetheless, this, is, this activity is all occurring between the glands in the endometrial uh, stroma. And one can observe that there are numerous uh, mitotic figures uh, in this region uh, as well, in addition to those mitotic figures as seen in the uh, proliferating glands. This is a histological section taken through uh, the wall of the human uterus at mid secretory phase. But this illustration or visual uh, representation illustrates is the three primary layers constituting the uh, uterine wall. First of all, the endometrium, which extends over the arrow, where the arrow now indicates shows this type of depth of this particular mucous membrane. Then the huge thickness of the myometrium 
as again indicated and in being traced by the pointer. And then at the very bottom of the field of view, if one is lucky, the sort of a mesothelial or light connective tissue aligning the parametrium. One can visualize quite well this extraordinarily thick myometrium, again is now indicated by the pointer. You can see this central area appears to have more and more blood vessels in it, or a, good, a better number of blood vessels as indicated by the pointer. So this, is, uh, this region, the central layer of the myometrium is oftentimes referred to as the uh, stratum vasculaire. Turning our attention now to the endometrium, one can make out at this low power, even though it, the section is taken at a rather uh, sort of uh, tangential angle, it isn't completely vertical, but nonetheless one can make out uh, the stratum base alley, this darker uh, layer which we'll examine a little bit later at higher magnification. And it can be visualized on this section, it's a little bit more intensely stained and on close observation one can see the glands have a more smooth luminal surface and are more uh, tubular in nature rather than uh, being coiled. Uh, they're more like straight tubes, they have a straight luminal surface. Uh, the remainder of the endometrium, the stratum functionalis, is shown here, a considerable depth at mid secretory, and one can even visual a stratum compactum up near the surface, and a stratum spongiosum, now where the arrow is now indicating. Uh, so-called because of the abundance of the uterine uh, glands, given this, it, that spongy type of appearance. So this is a whole mount preparation, uh, as seen visually, uh, a little wedge-like section taken from the human uh, uterine wall. This is a region of human endometrium taken at during the mid secretory phase of the uterine cycle. The uterine lumen is located in this particular region as indicated by the arrow, the surface lining epithelium, of course, uh, lying immediately adjacent to the lumen and consists of a simple columnar type of epithelium. And one can see a couple of uterine glands, one dividing there, another one taking their origin and then going out of the field of view as shown here. This thicker region, as now indicated by the pointer, is the stratum compactum of the functionalis. And as we go towards the myometrium, one can see the nature of the uterine glands, these are sort of cross-sectional profiles or uh, sections of it cut crossways as it goes in and out of the field of view. We're now entering the corpus spongiosum and of the functionalis and one can uh, see why. And then finally as we're coursing through the spongiosum or that very active layer of the functionalis. Note the texture and the color and the nature of the glands changes rather dramatically. Perhaps we will just stop at this point here. So this region about where the line of the arrow is now indicating is the functionalis going towards the lumen. The, the greater depth of the overall endometrium at this phase is going to be that functionalis. And that subcomponent of the functionality, this, uh, the spongy layer, or the uh, corpus spongiosum, is now shown and being crossed by the arrow. This darker region, extending all the way to the myometrium and being indicated by the arrow now, is the stratum base alley. Note that the nature of the glands with their smooth luminal profile mimics that of the proliferative 
phase. So it stays in this sort of proliferative phase and is not shed, this uh, stratum uh, base alley region. It forms sort of the surface from which every cycle will uh, come from after the functionalis is uh, sloughed. These glands in this region proliferate out as does the surrounding uh, stromal tissue to replace that which is lost uh, during each cycle. It can always be identified because there's greater cellularity in this area, more nuclei packed together. Uh, the cells aren't nearly as uh, filled with material and so you have a greater nuclear density giving this dark cast. Also the glands are smaller and more uniformly round in cross-sectional profile and relatively straight as compared to glands at this, particularly at this phase of the cycle, the uh, secretory phase, which they are much larger and have this very uh, torturous profile or sort of a corrugated uh, interior. So this is a good example of the comparison, that is, of the stratum base alley with the stratum functionalis here. The uterine glands uh, in the stratum functionalis, uh, seen at a slight increase ma in magnification showing their, their columnar nature and how convoluted and torturous the interior of these cross-sectional profiles of the glands really is. Also note within the lumen actually discharged uh, secretory uh, material. The stromal cells are continuing to plump up and in this particular area at this magnification coursing in between the glands we see a portion thereof of, or at least a portion of a, one of these spiral arteries. So this would be the same artery coming up and coursing in this direction. It's been cut uh, three times uh, and this is probably another one uh, coursing in this direction. Uh, it's hard to say whether these are uh, related. I am anticipating that or it could have, could have come up and then came uh, back down in the field if this is the same vessel coursing in this direction, three profiles in this direction, and then crossing over, coursing and looping like uh, uh, in this uh, region. But it, it's difficult to say on that particular uh, example. Nonetheless, this is typical. Uh, oh, here's a fairly decent one. Uh, Yes, very good. The lumen of a spiral artery coming up and then coursing like so. And you can see the number of little profiles of this very same vessel as it snakes through this region. How tight the coil has to be to get this many profiles cut in this very uh, limited sectional view which is under the uh, medium power objective. So this is a fairly good example of a spiral artery within the endometrium and supplying the endometrium. Recall that this vessel is also subject to hormonal influences and is the one that uh, clamps down and causing the tissue to become anoxic and eventually leading it to its death and or necrosis and sloughing. Again, another example of the uh, stratum functionalis of the endometrium. This is the corpus spongiosum uh, because of the torturous uh, nature of the uh, uterine glands and the uh, relatively vascular nature uh, and uh, edematous nature of the surrounding stroma. Now, this is at the base of the functionalis, so it's in the spongiosum just to provide a comparison with the stratum base alley, which we are now approaching. We are now entering the stratum base alley. Notice the difference in the texture of the endometrial uh, stroma, much more dense, darkly stained, and more fibroblast 
type of mesenchymal cells. And then note the nature of the uterine glands, a smooth luminal contour, uh, cells more closely packed together, and it gives one the idea that this is more closely akin to what one visualizes in the proliferative phase. So this is stratum basale, its typical appearance and depth, and then as one moves towards the surface of the uterine epithelium, you can see there is a, a uh, rapid transition into the stratum functionale, uh, and this will be the area or the region that is to be uh, sloughed eventually. Now that we're getting up closer to the stratum compactum, one can get a better appreciation for how the uh, stromal cells are more filled with uh, cytoplasm. They're much larger, lighter staining cytoplasm filled with glycogen and uh, uh, glycoproteins, those types of uh, products as we are coursing uh, towards the surface. So this is all stratum functionalis with the uterine glands. Another spiral artery, a fairly large one, uh, filling the field of view. I'm tracing it as we go near the surface. We now have uh, left it and then uh, another example of a spiral artery. It's uh, fairly near the surface. You see its profiles. Uh, extending even along at this point. Finally, we appear to be in the stratum compactum. Uh, more stromal cells very tightly close together. And then finally, we're at the surface uh, and the uterine lining epithelium.